Hey, thanks everybody for joining. This is another Microsoft Community Office Hours episode 18. And uh, the, the five of us are here. I'm including Beaker in that. He just mentioned in my ear that he appreciates it. <laughs> I guess that makes you Dr. Bunsen, honey. Too. Will, that's right. I will just, I'll tell you whatever he says and he has some good feedback. I, I do want to hear that once in a while though. <laughs> uh all right how's everybody uh how, how are the questions the q a from the community over the last week uh field any questions that are just top of mind that you want to discuss here this morning i didn't field any but i have one that uh is really interesting i don't know if anybody gets the whole volume of office 365 update emails whenever there's yeah. a change oh yeah it's just crazy um the amount of changes that they're doing every week now it's just yeah. like and they're even stating in the emails that they have to they're slowing stuff down because there's too much change going on at one time across all their applications but one that i did see that's really 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 cool and christian you'll appreciate this if you've used obs and a technology called ndi um, teams is going to be integrating ndi and uh, oh, you're shaking your head like you guys have already talked about this. No, we haven't talked about it on here. I just, uh, but I, I've seen the uh, the requests. I upvoted that, and uh, it's yeah. going to be rolled out in September. Now they they re they're going to release it. It's uh, rolled out, uh, going to be rolled out. And if no anybody doesn't know what NDI is, it's the the network device integration um, or network device uh, interface. I think that's the technical term. I'm not sure, but that allows you to take a bit like a video feed from another uh, network connected device and make that a separate channel that gets fed through your your uh, like team meeting or webinar or OBS or what have you. Very but sweet. With teams, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, that's, for, for those that aren't familiar, so we use, for example, for this live stream, we're using uh, Streamlabs OBS, but OBS is an open source. It's the, uh, what is it, uh, the open broadcast uh, uh, software. Software, yeah. And uh, it, it essentially, it, you can run it like a television station. You can have, you know, twenty different cameras if you have the hook at the computer capacity for that, uh, and with your video cards. But or they're IP based because NDI will allow you to correct. Do that so, but essentially, as different sources, and you can set up your screens or views. And like I have this little device. I'll try to pull it on camera here. So this, like this Elgato Stream Deck. And what's nice about this is I can program this in with different uh, views uh, in OBS and essentially just sit here and push a button and it'll fade over or just cut over to different views. And, and so I've actually set up my home office where I have zones. I'm gonna set up permanently a green screen over in this corner so I can do my little uh, PSAs. Uh, but uh, I, I could also have somebody come in if my dogs would allow it uh, to be interviewed and switch back and forth uh, with uh, with video between two cameras. So cool. can you yeah. can you set it to to do like a like a hi hat? So you can just push a button and you know, I, let I, it just stay somewhere. Okay, I, don't, I don't have the sound set up here. Snare drum. Yeah. So. It, it wasn't a priority for me to go in and reset up or to add the sounds into the, the screens, but I need to do that. I, 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 I just, and, and I just thought it was interesting because anybody be able to do this in Teams now. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's going to be like everybody's going to be kind of like a, a, a video jockey now. They're going to be like a, a, you know, a remote meeting jockey where they can pretty much just, oh, that's cool. I like that risk. Um, be able to but do then I have to show this fancy it's stuff. Not <laughs> virtual what backgrounds, think, virtual well, backgrounds aren't well. that big of a deal, but I mean, when you start getting into, you know, being able to bring in an actual like a gaming session, that's where it comes from, right? Right. A lot of gamers, yeah. You know, yeah. Have multiple feeds where they have four people on the screen playing at once and all that kind of fun stuff. Yes. Yeah. For that, that's why I've 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 talked about this in the past. I really want when we're sitting and discussing what questions we want to talk about next, I want to have a video running behind me 
of Fortnite. And just with me, with the green screen, <laughs> Fortnite going on, and we can talk about it. Then as soon as we show a screen share or something, or we're getting into depth in the topic, if you watch any of these content, sorry, I don't want to beat up on anybody, but the, the these millennial uh, videos, create videos, it, I think it's hilarious. It'll be just like Fortnite or or Apex or one of these games running rapidly or Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a little more old school, but... Uh, uh, and uh, and then suddenly it'll cut over to whatever video, whatever tool tip that they're talking about. And I've joked about wanting to create a like a SharePoint or a Teams training video that uses all of those modern practices for <laughs> that would be something else. Uh, yeah, well, one thing coming out I am very happy about the um, Azure CDNs are rolling out for SharePoint and OneDrive video hmm. so this is a big deal because microsoft um up until this point had been using you know they've always had azure cdns uh, content delivery networks um <clears throat> to store stuff and for performance reasons um it's always good to put a cdn in with uh sharepoint online but if you were uncomfortable with the idea of a third party, even if they're a licensed third party, hosting assets uh, in a CDN. That was sometimes a deal breaker. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Microsoft used, um, uh, what's the name of the company? Can't think of them right now. Big edge nodes. Come on, guys. I think quick. you're making all that up, Sean. I have we no idea. Uh, no. I, I just want to know what we're just waiting for you. No. Um, oh, Jesus. It'll come back to me. But anyway, so Microsoft now is using their Azure CDNs. Hey, Hal. For um, Good morning. hosting uh, SharePoint video and OneDrive video, and they're going to cache it there. And that's first party. So that's uh, an in-house solution that removes a lot of the security concerns a lot of people have uh, about uh, protected content and sensitive content going into CDNs. So we'll see that coming out here. It says uh, targeted release mid-August, complete worldwide by end of August. So this is rolling out to everybody's tenant. That's very cool. Yeah, I think that the I, those are the two of the biggest requests around um, around stream, around video production. Um, the third being, and I, I don't know any progress on this. Maybe you guys do uh, around the anonymous access. So uh, essentially, being able to uh, and this goes back to what we've talked about week after week: the you know, difference between Teams and these webinar platforms being that Teams is an enterprise collaboration solution versus these other public solutions. But one of the, the you know, I, I would love the idea of being able to publish videos out publicly with anonymous access rather than re-uploading to YouTube. A lot of people would like that. Um, yeah. So um, what was the, sorry, what was, was it, uh, I just remembered what what was Microsoft's YouTube uh, entry that that died? Was it was it soap? No, that doesn't make sense. It was soapbox. Soapbox. Remember soapbox? Yeah, way back when. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember the content provider I'm thinking about, Akamai. Akamai. Oh. Okay. Akamai. Yeah. Akamai. That rolls off the tongue. No, yes. <laughs> What'd you say, Eric? I see. I asked Sean to be honest when when he said he remembered, because I, I heard some furious typing after the. <laughs> <laughs> now my memory fails yeah. me a lot, but not today. Well, excellent. Uh, uh, for those of you that missed it too, by the way, uh, over the over the weekend, um, noticed a tweet from uh, Mr. Buckley, um, the now in, infamous. Uh, I want to make sure I get this right. DJ Krusty Cake? No. Is it? <laughs> DJ Krusty Cake. <laughs> Is that right? No. Is that right? It's 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 DJ Crispy Crisp. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> you, were, you were really, really close to Mike. You, you, were, you were thinking, I know you were thinking, you were thinking SpongeBob, you know, Krusty Krab, Krusty Cake. <laughs> Mike. I, think I he was totally thinking, knew that. I, I totally think he was thinking that. donuts myself. I think I think he was it was Krispy Kreme and then Krusty <laughs> <laughs> Cake. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I just registered the domain, crustycake.com. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have a redirect to Buckley Planet. There you go. Yeah, that's it for, for people that are wondering. So back in uh, back in uh, college oh, in the late 80s, we decided it was necessary that we all have rap names. And uh, so I was uh, Crispy Crisp. Yeah. Crispy so. Crisp. How about that? Yeah, the, the etymology of the name, uh, it, it's derived from uh, the mid-80s Taco Bell Cinnamon Crispas, mm. which I made the mistake of eating in front of somebody in the dorms in Drop 86, 87, and, uh, and then was assigned that name by this individual. Nice. Uh, who could never remember my name as Christian and just called me Crispy. And so Crispy Crisp was the logical rap name. So, I like my name better. Yeah. The evolution of the name. Yeah. Pretty good. Crusty Cake. <laughs> DJ Crusty Cake. What's <laughs> dropping some serious tones. Uh, all right. So as far as uh, other, other questions, anything else, um, Eric or Hal? Any no, other questions no, pop up? No question. <laughs> there was a lot of no. uh, conversation after... Uh, some of the Microsoft announcements and warnings and notifications came out about file sharing in Teams and how it will finally be adopting the familiar interface and accessibility features of OneDrive and everything else where you can share internally, externally, time box uh, documents and all that good stuff. So lots of conversations there. No, no questions really because it's already out there and everyone's used to it or most anyway are used to it. That was a big deal when Microsoft went and uh, uh, consolidated the uh, the experiences. There's that word again, Eric, just for you. Um, <laughs> I've heard they, that. Yeah. No, but the experiences across, uh, that was a big question for a long time is, you know, why is the, uh, where the underlying technology is the same uh, between OneDrive for Business and, uh, and SharePoint List? Like, why is the experience so different? And so they went in and made that a unified experience. They went in and fixed things like the sharing button. Um, when you share something, that it's a consistent experience across workloads. Um, and, uh, and so that, you know, to, to see something like this, to, to say within Teams, hey, you know, hey, we need to have that consistent experience. Whether or not it's something that, again, benefits from the fact that all of this stuff rolls under the domain of uh, Mr. Teeper and whether he's uh, influencing this stuff or it's been the plan in the works for a long time, I'm still going to throw things towards the Teeper direction mm -hmm. that he's pushing for that. So he, he was, uh, he was really big on when he kind of came back to the SharePoint space of improving uh, the look and feel and the, you know, unifying the experiences across work. Consistency. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. Cool. So I, have to, I have to change my background to show this properly. Yes. I think that. Was well, this the score keeping? Oh dear. Today? I think it's it's only fair to do that. So you'll, you'll actually I, see my my real home here for a moment, as I remove the background, which looks nothing like this. Okay. No, there are flames everywhere. Yeah, there's be, exactly. It would be really funny though, as you switched over, if suddenly there were children screaming and. That's right. <laughs> So the experience scorecard you can see is at six. All right, excellent. Now, now for clarity, for those who may be new to the show, the over under for today is fifty nine and a half. <laughs> uh, you can email all of your your various uh, guesses and such to to Christian Buckley. You have are email? you still are you still taking bets now, or is it closed for today's event? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm I don't I don't gamble. I just I just win, Eric. <laughs> I I can neither confirm nor deny that there's any gambling. gambling. Yeah. 
Uh, it is legal here in Ontario, so if anybody would like to, you know, send their guesses in the over under fifty nine and a half, <laughs> and go. I'll tell you that we're already at six. All right. Well, so there are some questions that are posted up on it, uh, and so we pull questions from those that haven't participated in one of the live streams uh, from two locations out of Facebook, from the Office three sixty five community as well as the Microsoft Teams community. Um, there's a, a a question that was asked earlier this morning uh, uh, by um, uh, Matik or Matic. Um, Hello, community. Hope someone can point me in the right direction. A client would like to add their domain to the tenant and migrate on-prem exchange to Microsoft 365. They can't add the domain because the domain in question was added to another tenant somewhere in the past. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They proved they own the domain and they can't log into the old tenant to disconnect the domain. They lost access data. All they have is username, but they don't know the pass and they can't reset the password as they didn't register for password oh, reset. Wow. Any ideas on how to solve this? To Wait it out. Survey says? <laughs> Wait oh, it out. Eventually it will lapse. Not it will lapse, but you can accelerate it. So yeah. I actually had a domain that was in the same situation. The main, the, the main admin, um, well, the person, the person who set it up actually passed away uh, unexpectedly and uh, took all of the IDs and passwords uh, with them, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. So uh, had the same situation, had opened a ticket with support. Support took about a week and a half, week, week and a half. They wanted documentation on the on proof, uh, proof of ownership of the domain. And then after all the documentation was submitted, they they released the domain from the original tenant, um, and then the new tenant was able to adopt it. And it yeah, takes so, a while to get it done. Yeah, but that's. I, but I think that's the the, the important point, though, is that uh, yeah, you need to call in to support, get that process started, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's it's one of the reasons why I don't know what what you've all done, but here being independent, you know, going and setting up my tenant, um, so I set up. Um, two alternates, so my uh, daughter and my wife, uh, so that yep. they, they have that the, that access. So if something happens to me that two other people have access. So um, yeah, that's, that's important to go and then. And that was what actually one of the initiatives uh, that Microsoft is doing across all of their platforms now. So I remember at Summit last year, uh, one of the things that came up was um, around uh, at the time. It was around ownership of the Office 365 licensing. Mm -hmm. And you can actually set up another person to be, you know, ownership, the claim ownership of your 365 licensing if you can no longer access it. Um, but they've also extended that now. They've actually, I got a notice now that even GitHub, um, GitHub, you can actually, if you have a GitHub account, account with repos, you can actually specify a predecessor. Nice. Well. Yeah, so someone who can take over if you don't respond within, you know, X amount of days or whatever to request to, you know, take over the account. Yeah, a lot of products are putting that in these days. Um, LastPass has yeah. the idea of uh, handing down, you know, your password store to somebody and you can designate them yep. as a recipient. Should something happen to you, they can get access to your passwords and everything. So I, I think it's a great idea. That. I, I need to go and I, I'm a paid user of LastPass. I need to go in and take a look at that. I'd Yeah, we, we actually yeah. purchased the family plan because you can Definitely. purchase the family plan in LastPass. And what yeah. happens is that you can you specify like beneficiaries, if you will, yeah. um, you know, where, you know, my wife gets access. And then after that, my son would get access. But it's after a 14 days, like a 14 day waiting period. So even if you request access, they try and ping you for like 14 days. And if they don't get a response from you, then they say, oh, okay, you know, now you can access his uh, vault. So. Exactly right. Yeah. It's awesome. So. Yeah. You know what actually caused me to go in and look at this is a few years back was um, investing in some cryptocurrencies. And so it, which resulted in uh, that was the original reason for purchasing a gun safe prior to there being guns. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but also a safety deposit box. But but thinking about that, and I had a good friend that advised me on that, and he's like making sure that 
you know, you know, hearing the horror stories of people that lose their, you know, their their codes to to get yeah. in, get access to uh, to cryptocurrencies, and once it's gone, it's like it's gone. It's yeah, you know, no one can get to that. So exciting times yeah so i went in and just kind of ensured that uh you know all that stuff was accessible so if something happened to me again if you know um that uh children and spouse know how to get to things so but one of the things that idea. I, yeah one of the things i've noticed though is that if you look at your last pass my last pass at least i've got like you know probably eight nine ten years worth of vault yeah <laughs> oh so, um I'm with yeah. you mike a lot of it's not relevant anymore, but a lot of it is and stuff I haven't accessed in like four or five years. And if my wife were to get that, she'd probably look at that and go, where do I even start? <laughs> you know, um, so it's a it's a challenge. But at the same time, I, I only bring this up because a friend of mine created a video and uh, uh, they created this video for his wife and his children. So if something happened to him. And what he's done is he's archived that video and you can send it up to a service. And what they'll do is if they receive your, or they watch for obituaries. Um, and if the, your obituary shows up, they'll release that video to your loved ones. Mm. I, I thought it was really interesting, this service that they do, but you know, he has to pay to have this service, you know, and it's like nine bucks a year or something like that, that he pays. Oh, the dead drop. So I, yeah. I, have to, I have to ask, devil's advocate here. I know of, of a few people who insisted when they passed away that they did not have an obituary printed. For whatever reason, whatever creditors they had chasing them, I don't know. These were all elderly people and that they're now in a better place, perhaps. Uh, uh, bosses. So, yeah, exactly. That too. So if there's no, if there is no obituary, then too bad. <laughs> you have to have <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what the situation is there, but I mean... You know, it, it could be a situation. It could be something where, um, you know, they get notified by the the next of kin. So, you know, they tell someone to notify this company. I don't know. I don't know how. I think, I think you should have. I think they should have uh, more of a Ferris Bueller's Day Off kind of an experience where you just you just produce a body and and we'll send you all your passwords. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Just yep. produce the body. That's yeah. Ferris plan. <laughs> just. Just roll the old bones in here, and all's good. <laughs> what was the name? What's the principal's name? The principal's Don't name. Don't Googling it right now. <laughs> Everybody's Googling it. Look it up. Look it up. I'm not. Uh, you know, maybe there's a conversation for a different time, but uh, has anybody left instructions, funeral instructions for their family? Yeah. Um, mine, I've d oh. driven into my, like, my kids are aware of this, where I said that, I, you know, they're, what if my only, I said, do whatever you want. I said, but my one requirement is for the first 15 minutes of when people are in there, I said, they have to play Duran Duran <laughs> at an uncomfortable level. <laughs> and so my instruction to my children is that if you could have take on and like have a regular normal conversation, it's not at an uncomfortable level. Turn it up a bit. <laughs> and 15 minutes of solid of people of especially the old people in the crowd getting angry like can we turn this off this this sacred moment so we can remember remember him it was like no this is specific this is the only thing he wanted written you in yeah you know, uncomfortable the, level that's who's awesome the, who's you the know, audience and, there because you know what's inco un uncomfortable to to me or to anybody else here is is going to be very comfortable to the older people <laughs> Yeah, they won't, they won't hear most of it anyway. That's right. Yeah, I just, I just, what I think is hilarious is that my, uh, of my children, you know, one, one of them, my son Nick is like, he'll, he'll be like, oh yeah, and I'll carry it out. I'll make sure that that happens, Dad. You know, like, and I, I, I can count on him to do that. So. You can count on me, Dad. <laughs> that's right. I'll be there turning uh, it. Uh, that's hey, awesome. here, here's a question, uh, and this is a good question. I don't know the answer to. Um, um, so Hale asked the question over on the Teams community. Uh, bought an external mic to use on Teams, but doesn't seem to work on Teams. Works otherwise, though. Teams always uh, also recognizes it, but just says didn't work. Huh. So anybody experienced that with hardware? What, uh, what kind of mic? Um, USB connected? Is it just connecting to an yeah, it's RCA? USB. 
So okay. he's got an error message that he's sharing. So it shows that it just says microphone, uh, word form, USB, didn't work. Work for computer. Better drivers, newer drivers. Yeah, just, that was, mm-hmm. that's a good comment is uh, make sure that you have, don't just have the default driver that, you know, might be listed, go and do it immediately. That's kind of a, it's a good rule of thumb with any new hardware always no matter how new it is you know just released look for the latest uh updates truth speaking of new hardware this weekend i had the unfortunate incident of (laughs) i opened adobe lightroom and my system just bottomed out sat at 100 percent cpu utilization for hours and i i'm like when was the last time i got a new computer you bought mm-hmm. a new computer mm-hmm. Uh-oh. i have a core i7 5960 i looked it up that was released q3 2014 mm-hmm. it was the extreme product at that time but you know the eight cores just aren't doing it right now so i'm gonna throw more hardware at this thing you gonna upgrade, or yep. you gonna buy oh, the whole box new? Um, probably the. I'm gonna do both. Really, I'm gonna save, reuse the drives and video cards and whatnot. Um, but motherboard, cooling, CPU, uh, memory, and whatnot will be new. Okay. Yeah. If that was a helm. Just to be, just to clarify, you're improving your experience. <laughs> did, you, did you already check that off? Yes, correct. As soon right. as I saw the first first smile of the lips, I checked it off. Yes. Indeed, I am. Uh, hey, I've got a question from a friendly out there, somebody we know, uh, Mr. Greg Frick. From the, those that don't know, Greg was a longtime president of the Puget Sound SharePoint user group or the Seattle area um, oh. SharePoint user group. Hey, Greg. Uh, and so help put on, so he was a compatriot in putting on the SharePoint Saturdays for all those years over there on the Microsoft campus. He asked a question uh, a few hours ago, file share to SharePoint migration ideas or input sought. Uh, since the engagement and collective knowledge in this group is so high, I'd love to blah, blah, blah. He just goes on. It's, uh, that's an experience in itself. Uh, uh, so I've been a SharePointer since 2007, so I'm knowledgeable, but I'm continually re- reminded that I don't know everything. I'm thinking about the experience of users that have gotten <laughs> used to clicking through folder hierarchies, finding their files in a modern site. I'm thinking of things like the use of multiple libraries, web parts on a homepage, use of content types, and or just site columns. Default column values in site columns to help classify content setting the managed properties to searchable um any uh questions uh, or, or or any any guidance on moving from that experience especially into a teams world this is posted in the microsoft teams community so it's a question about moving that over to teams and best practices for taking that complexity and merging that over i have a whole deck that that speaks to this um i can't i can't bring it out of my little brain here off the top of my head but if he reaches out to me i'm happy to share it yeah so that's uh, so it just it made me think about um so we just uh gotten eric we just discussed this on the call last week so sue hanley is going to be doing a an information architecture session it's not until uh, september october i'm gonna go look at the dates but that's a she's a great resource she's constantly writing about talking about uh information architecture and specifically addressing issues of moving from that sharepoint world over into the team's world um but just some highlights from that deck from that presentation eric uh you know the thoughts anything that you could kind of share before doing a deep dive with uh, with Greg into your PowerPoint presentation, which Use makes for great live streaming. Use a tool. 
It's a it's a crappy experience here and now, Eric, for you to refer to a slide presentation somewhere else. Well, since I, I didn't have the questions beforehand, so I had to do my best. None, none of us did, Eric. <laughs> well, the, first of all, I want to clarify something. If if the experience word comes in from a question, I think that's is true. And I heard it twice there from, from Greg. Yeah, I, I no, I agree. I agree. Okay. I think that's only fair. I, and I think at some point there's a three pointer, a three point shot somewhere that's back even further behind the line on the, from the outside. I think that's valid as well. So uh, more, more of an experienced Hail Mary. Right. And then if there's a three pointer plus a foul, you know, and one somewhere. Yeah. And one. Yeah. So in short, uh, I would, I would say use a tool, obviously. Um, it's not something you want to start mucking around with. Um, but before you even get to that point, from a strategic perspective, you've got to understand source and use of the information. You know, so much of, of our worlds now are focused on single source content, one document that lives in one place but is shared in multiple places where when updates occur, they're, they're done once and pushed to the various sources, or sorry, various uses and, and resources that are using that information. Uh, you've got to get a good handle on what information you have out there and, and where you're putting it, and where it's going, before you actually do anything. Yeah, and I think the key there is part of that is is that there's not a one to one. It it does take a rethinking of that information. Could it be that you just teamify that? existing SharePoint or legacy SharePoint site, that's an option. Uh, is it that you make it a legacy environment that you reference via, you know, the lists and libraries via tabs within a new team, um, migrate some content and the rest of it, you just, you know, are archive and what we can, we've talked about the various definitions of archival, what that means. So in the loosest sense of archiving, meaning that you know, it's accessible to everyone, but it's not, no one's accessing that site through navigation over on your portal. Uh, it's not a teamified site. It may only be accessible through those tabs and through the file experience in Teams now with this new site, but the content is still there. So it's all ser still searchable. So how you set that up and map that, and it's also, uh, there's not one uh, way of doing that that's going to match every one of those legacy SharePoint sites um, and, and that complexity. So it it uh, it should be driven largely by the owners of those sites and and of, of that content. How you're going to need to access that, but right. as an organization, you've got to identify what what the date is that from which you're, you're bringing content over and, and everything else has to go somewhere else or nowhere, just leave it where it is. Um, you know, the, there are a lot of people, a lot of clients are, are using the seven year rule as that sort of point where they'll bring forward anything. Years old. Um, but when you actually do a, an accounting and uh, an audit of your information at a site level and you realize that, you know, Two thirds of your sites aren't being touched, or haven't been touched in so many years. You've got to rethink the purpose of all that content. You know, we sort of get we get too comfortable with okay, everything is there, and I can access anything, even if it's from seven years ago. And that's not an efficient way to do business going forward. You know, anything in my world, I'd probably say anything twelve months or older, I haven't looked at. So I could I could call or, or archive. All of my personal content and most organizations operate on a let's say 18 month cycle right if you need to do anything in in hr for your 360 reviews and such you go back a year you look at what's there you, it, you, you know, change dates and, and save as and move it forward you don't go back two three four five years you need from um, from an employment perspective to have the records but you can archive them so this is where you've got to identify what really makes sense, what really needs to be there moving forward and where you don't. And if you don't, don't, don't just think that because you have a script or, or a product or a routine to bring it in, that you need to bring it forward. As many labels as you can get on it too. Classification, yeah. metadata, because you know the experience in SharePoint 
is going to leverage that metadata navigation if you enable it and you can search filter whatever uh, faceted navigation and filtering so as much as you can tag items with uh, terms it's going to aid your your journey yep and Eric, I, I just uh, commented over in, in, uh, in Greg's post there. I know you're not on the book of faces, so uh, I, I let him know that you'd reach out to him with, with a link there. And do you have that published out somewhere that you can share the link to that, that presentation? Or is it one that's not yet publicly consumable? I would have to go through uh, a sanitization process before yeah. I made it. Okay. You just had to say yes or no. That's all. Just make it complex. Wow. Proprietary I like content. I like to give full answers. It's not just about you know oh. throwing it out somewhere. It's, it needs to be mocked. <laughs> needs a haircut. Let's see. Uh, any other new questions? Um, do, do, do. um so Nitin has a question here. Um, any suggestions how we can auto map network drives or printers for Azure AD joined users? So when users log into their device, it should auto map both the network drives and printers. Currently, we have to map it manually. If they're Active Directory, if they're in Azure Active Directory, they should not because the GPO Login scripts. What's that? Login scripts. That's the old login script thing. It is, it is. Um, in, but in Azure Active Directory, it's policies, right? So uh, it's kind of a horse of bees. But if they have the policies set up properly, um, if these are hybrid users that use AAD, then they should be able to map to on-premises devices just like they would if they logged in locally. Yeah, uh, Andy also shares a link, uh, a blog post on automating network drive mapping configuration with Intune. Yeah, you can do that with Intune. Uh, that's uh, for mainly for um, MDM uh, or associated devices, uh, iPads, uh, Android devices, stuff like that. Um, but you can extend that to the Windows 10 desktop as well now. I mean, the Intune is is becoming the new uh, administration platform for Windows 10 devices. So. Yeah, I think we're at the point now too where um Um, file services and DFS is um, getting much smarter. DFS distributed file services in Windows. That's in DFS. I mean, it, they're they're kind of kind of the same. I mean, what 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 are you saying exactly? They're getting smarter. What do you mean by that? Well, I, it's very easy to set those up and map them with DFS and roll that out to folks via policy and whatnot. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and it's been easier with Azure files. If you're going to move your everything up into Azure files instead of having it local or on premises with uh, DFS or RDFS, um, Azure files just hooks right into Azure AD. So, yeah. Now it does. I should say you can authenticate the Azure files with Azure AD. That just came out like three weeks ago. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, there's another question that was just asked. Uh, uh, on asked, uh, hi guys, my Outlook 2016 is taking too much time to load and sometimes halts and not responding state. As I have a high spec machine around 80 gigs of free space in Outlook, but still taking time to open and load messages. Create a new profile. Delete your profile. Yeah. One or Create a new profile. Wow. Your profile is probably corrupt. Yeah. Oftentimes it's web service. I've had that well. happen a couple of times. Yeah, it could be web services, depending on what add-ons and stuff they have or what uh, associated stuff they have going on in Outlook. But creating a new profile, wipe that out, and they'll just be able to, you know, start over from scratch, basically. And save your, save your PST if you can, but, I mean, and your OST. But. <laughs> yeah, don't pull the well, boulder the over the, the, the internet again. A lot of yeah. OSTs, if they're not... I turn if you if you lose the uh, Outlook profile that created an OST, the OST is toast. So 
OSTs yeah. don't do you any good. They rebuild anyway. Sure. Yeah. It, the only yeah. place you have to be careful of is if you happen to have an IMAP account. And some of the things like contracts or calendar or, or the like wind up being local. Uh, they'll have a little disclaimer where it says this computer only. Uh, if that's the case, then what you need to do is uh, to move those particular pieces into a PST file from the OST file. Um, and uh, that way, if you have to do a rebuild or something like that, you don't lose all that stuff. Right. And I'll tell you that, uh, Hal, the interesting question on that is uh, I had a situation where they, they have an OST repair tool. I don't know if people know this, but you can go out to Microsoft and get an Outlook profile repair tool, which basically goes out and repairs your OST. There are third party uh, ones as well. Right. So I've actually had people that will create a new profile just to get started, just to get Outlook back up, right? And make sure there's nothing wrong or if it's an add-on, de determine if it's the profile or an add-on that's causing the problem or or what it is. But Al, you bring up a good point because I've had people that say, well, um, they don't, they, they delete their original profile and they create a new one. And I just say create a new one. The reason is because if you can get back into that old profile, a lot of folks forget their like contacts you know, um, and uh, anything else that they've had uh, associated with that old profile. So if they delete it ahead of time and then create a new one, they lose all that. They don't have the capability of getting at it at all. Even though you st might, still might have the file, you can't get to it because the profile's been deleted. Right? With an OST file, yeah, that's correct. But not with a PST file. It's a standalone file, open and export Outlook data file, and that's right. how you get back into it. PST right. files... While they're fragile, they're nice. Yeah. I agree. I still remember going back to the days when they would say that having two, what was it, uh, you know, two gig PST files trying to traverse <laughs> network and stuff like that, you know, trying to, when people would log in and pull it out of their home drives. Oh, you know, boy. Across the network. Yeah. yeah, that crazy stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Back when networks weren't quite yeah, as quick well, as they are now. So I've got a, this is less of a question and more of a, a, a comment, and there's a hearty discussion happening, uh, 37 comments on, on this, but I'd love to get your points. This kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with uh, information architecture. Um, but Jeremy states that it's, it's really hard to sell teams during a massive on-prem to Office 365 document migration when it can't handle content types. And so I, I don't know if uh, he's not lying. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you know what? So organizations that have spent a lot of time and effort and money around building out the content types and building out that kind of intricate document management solution on SharePoint and moving to a team centric like, so what do you tell customers? Eric, is that in your deck? Is that part of the experience that you share with clients? Don't abuse. Don't abuse the deck. <laughs> the, the sacred deck. Sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, just because, just for that, it, it's not. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it, the deck has already been sanitized, and that did not make it into the final cut, unfortunately. Yeah. But we'll uh, we'll have to see. Perhaps yeah, so, we can bring it back in. Yeah, so I mean, so what's the, uh, I, and I know I don't mean to get into such a, a, a no, I do mean to get into a, a deep topic here, but uh, just skim the top layer of that. Uh, so I mean, what, so what, how do you begin that conversation with the, with the client to explain the, the differences in, and their previous investment? Well, it's, first of all, I hate to do, I hate to do this, not that much really, I love doing this, but it depends on the client. It depends on it depends on goals. It depends on experience, and it depends on a million a million things, not the least of which is budget. But it really depends on the journey. Journey really being a, a, a yeah, it's the same as they're a great band. They are. I I was just thinking of uh, I just Don't heard the stop believing. The radio this morning, I just realized that one of the band members, it was his dad who arranged all the strings 
and all of their early hits. So guy that, uh, you know, er- early, the young guys that are in their what early twenties and, and it's like, dad, can you help me out with this? And all the strings that were, uh, were laid out by one of their dads. So that was kind of cool. No. Uh, so I, I think you're, you're exactly right. The, about the, it depends, uh, solution on it. I think one of the, there's a couple of people that made the comment without reading through all the detail, uh, Tobias Kaprowski, good friend, uh, based out of the UK now, um, who, who had uh, a few different answers here. Andrew Jolly, um, down out of, uh, Australia, um, kind of saying the same thing saying, look, it's, it's, a uh, it's an incomplete story for those that are looking for a, a one-to-one match from what you built in SharePoint over to Teams, but it's also it's a different experience. You can't go in there thinking that it's a apples to apples migration across that they're used in a different way. The work that you, I, I mean, I would say that the work that you've done, it's all still valid for your portal. How you access that and add to that and continue leveraging what you've built on the, I mean, there's there's parity issues from moving from on-prem to online with a lot of that capability. That's really the core of the question. It has nothing to do with Teams. It, it, you know, you it, moving to SharePoint online is, is different. There's, there's those questions. You could have a hybrid environment in place and access that content and use it like a service for those, those sites. There's things that you can do to leverage what you've already built, I guess is my my point. But then there's a different way of thinking about you know, how uh, people are collaborating, um, how you're story capturing the content and storing it, um, that you need to you know, rethink, redesign those, those experiences where you might have to develop you know, additional workflows, you might have to get a bit artistic on how you're accessing those legacy systems. Yeah, it's, there's not a a third party tool that'll just magically go in and move those things across and it'll work the same way. Third party tools are good for moving content. They're not good for for implementing or assisting in long-term journey and strategy and change and adoption. Right. That, those are two if not three entirely different conversations and they have to be addressed accordingly. True debt. Yeah. Yep. Hey, teacher time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I see I, Mike's got SpaceX. Very nice. Love SpaceX. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, very nice. from the family. I went old school. You didn't see it. It was one of my favorites. Yeah, I remember that. The old BA Insights t-shirt. Very good. All right. What is that, circa 2007? No, a little bit newer than that. I think it's uh, 2010, 2011. I think it's That sounds about right. Yeah. I'm just going from the SharePoint logo. Yeah. So that was... uh, yeah, it's 2010. That's 2010. Yeah. So it could have been fall of 2000. I'm trying to remember if I if they had these at SharePoint conference in 2009. I think it was 2010. Vegas. I think it was 2010. So it was. Uh, it's actually the T-shirt is held up because I uh, removed it from circulation for years, <laughs> um, and uh, had it in uh, the. I thought it was going to be in the, another one of the share quilts. And for those, everybody here like knows what that is. I don't know. Actually, Hal and Mike, I don't know if you know what the, we've not talked about it in a while, the, the share quilt. But so I actually had, you know, we go to conferences, we get these t-shirts. We, for some reason, we say yes and vendors throw different stuff at us. And occasionally we see, yeah, we, occasionally we see, uh, sometimes it's quite literally thrown at us. Um yeah. But we, we have these collections, and uh, so I would – a lot of the, the, the my favorites, you know, hang on to them, I, and I'm, you know, slow to give them up, you know. Um, but I went and cut them up 
and with the help of my mother-in-law, um, sewed them into a quilt, double-sided, that's now hanging as a piece of art in building 34 at Microsoft. Hmm. So you can actually go, and there's a four-square check-in, so you can actually go and check in at the quilt. I think Mark Cashman is still the the mayor, mayor. of that location. Although Tasha and a few others have uh, tried to steal it away from him, but he's quick to go back there and grab it back. Protect his territory. Yeah. So every time I visit campus, uh, I make sure that I venture over to the uh, to the quilt to check in. But I have a like a, an army duffel bag that is filled with other shirts, and this was in there hiding. And I went through it to try and purge. I think I went through. I don't. I mean, it's filled it it's stuff filled so how many t-shirts does it take to fill an army duffel bag um, Quite a few. Mm-hmm. And, and right and i think what i went through to purge i thought i'm, I'm gonna go to the thrift store i'm gonna donate a bunch of stuff and only two found their way out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. that's uh, awesome uh I, I need to let go of some of that stuff yeah leave it there long enough and then i go in i'll go in another two three years from now and be like why the heck did I hold on to all? I have no idea. And you'll find uh, another, at least two. Now the baseline is two for, for yeah. the purge. Exactly. I like, but uh, the most of them, I go back in there and I'm like, these are not quilt worthy. Mm. Hashtag quilt worthy. Yeah. Quilt worthy. Yeah. I've got a ca- uh, closet full of uh, SharePoint Saturday speaker polos. I actually, when I went back to work at Cardinal for my second tour of duty, I wore a speaker shirt and uh, one of the guys who worked there asked me he's like how many of those do you have i'm like quite a few so he challenged me to wear a different one every day for a week i wore a different one every day for a month yeah yeah piece of cake (laughs) challenge accepted exactly that's not even close to difficult (laughs) not at all well, this is like now, I, I think it was, I mean, I really liked the uh, Ignite t-shirt, with the cassette tape and the heart around it mm-hmm. that we modeled our, you know, our, our local event, our SharePoint Saturday uh, after that with a similar design. Um, but I found that was the only t-shirt that and Year of Yammer. So I brought home two t-shirts from that major event. And I just kept saying, no, 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 don't, don't want to carry crap home. Don't want to add to the duffel bag. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I, think you've given, I think you've given all the marketers that are tuning in to this a, a very good idea, which is they should be handing, handing you a duffel bag. <laughs> a branded, a branded duffel right. bag. That's right. To, there you go. Luggage set, yeah. 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 No, I, I think the lesson to be learned from marketers, like people love – the, the t-shirts, but design a t-shirt that people will want to wear. Yeah. How frustrating it is that we've all done this work for companies that have got to market it and it's this ugly and it's the, the you know, they want to get the, like the low end cheaper shirts and stuff. And people love <laughs> the comb cotton. Now the super soft, thinner um, right. uh, shirts, um, but create a logo uh, design, something that's fun or funny that's branded but that people will then want to go and wear. Exactly. I got, you know, the, the most famous shirt that I designed years back and I've, uh, I've resurfaced it a couple times is the share point. So a uh, picture of share or uh, uh, what was the other one? Everybody was, somebody asked one time, um, what is it? Uh, the disco singer. Um, anyway, so somebody, somebody walked up one time and said, like, what do you have, like, a was it Donna Summer? That's what it was like. What do you have oh. Donna Summer on your T-shirt? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not Donna Summer. You're not, you're not sure. Trump, are you? Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, memorable. But people would wear that. And, uh, you know, I, I wore them for a while. I would actually hand them out and say, be careful what neighborhoods you wear this in. You get might get beat up, you know, wearing a share T-shirt. I've but, got uh, mine. <laughs> but, yeah, That's an awesome but people, shirt loved that shirt and it got replicated out there uh, uh you know in, in the population and people you know other other companies grabbed it that that wasn't okay but um since i actually paid an artist to do a an original image uh that was used but 
Uh, but create a design that people want to wear, and people will wear that that shirt. It's uh, it's fantastic. I I joke that I I did a um, just share t shirt that had we did it for a SharePoint Saturday, and a year later I we did that in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. A year later, I went through and I was speaking at the user group in downtown San Francisco, and uh, man, I kid you not, there's a, I see this fire brick red shirt. And I'm just like, and, and I see the sponsors on the back. I'm like, no way. Somebody just walking down the street wearing the t-shirt that we did a year earlier. That's awesome. Um, so it was just cool to see that out in the wild. Yeah. That's really very cool. <laughs> I turned in, uh, turned in a bunch of clothes to Goodwill. And then to have one of the tech t-shirts that I turned in. And then uh, a year later, sometime later, I actually see someone like at the grocery store or in Walmart or something, wearing that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. uh, I used to own that shirt <laughs> because it's 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 so obscure. I mean, it's it's a tech shirt that nobody else would have uh, have unless they were actually at the conference at the right. time. They right. walked up and talked to that vendor and got that vendor to give the shirt. <laughs> uh, I just noticed. Oh. Um... Wow, somebody else asking that exact same question a few days ago about migrating um, old SharePoint on-prem farm to Office 365 tenant and what to move, what are the best practices when moving content to Teams. Um, so that's just interesting to see. That's, uh, yeah, 14 days ago, two weeks ago, somebody asked the same question. Mm. It's a concern. A lot of people want guidance. When Mr. Rizd is, uh declassifies his deck, perhaps someone will share. Now you got the beaker eyes going. Yep. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Anything else? Hal, any, you run into anything, anything in the last few days? Well, if I'm still here, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can. Oh, okay. Real good. Um, there was last week's Outlook meltdown. Uh, Microsoft received uh, released an update and it hit uh, monthly and I think semi-annual. Uh, Fast uh, Insider Fast wasn't affected a few others. Basically, you'd launch Outlook and it just would be there for a minute or two and then it would go away. It wouldn't say anything. It just simply would go yeah. away, quit. And uh, that was a uh, service problem that they had on there and um, the uh, <laughs> all the forums lit up like crazy. Um, and uh, the immediate fix was to bump to the prior to revert to the version that just was updated. Um, and uh, I don't know, within about three hours after the uh, the initial start of the problem, they uh, they managed to release a, a service fix for it. And uh, uh, so people. Basically, just restart the restart out like a couple of times, work to make the change up, and uh, then everything was happy again. But sure, were a lot of people without Outlook for a little while. I think that was Monday Monday morning. I think a lot of angry Not people. Confused. Yeah, I just, and I didn't understand it. How we were on the same call, uh, the uh, renewal call. Remember that? And uh, you yeah. actually, one of the MVPs actually is a new MVP, um, came on and just started. Hey, the emergency, emergency, code red, Outlook doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And this is, you know, he's kind of freaking out about it. And Hal is just like, hey, just restart it a couple of times. It's cool. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, uh, it's just like, you know, I'm sitting here going, hey, it's email, people. Come on. I mean, it's not the first time email has gone, you know, has, has died. I mean, it's. <laughs> um, I've actually heard in some circles that that, that was a, a test from Microsoft directly uh, and specifically focused to see how many Outlook users there were. <laughs> Basically, right. Outlook, Outlook test to, to Teams test, because the people who weren't freaking out were the ones who are using Teams to communicate versus <laughs> those who are using Outlook in the whole inner outer loop conversation. They were actually testing Bill Gates's right. facial recognition software <laughs> that can be over 5G you know, that it is going to corrupt the world. That's what it was, Riz. 
All I know is that I responded to that Gates memo and I got my thousand dollars. So I don't know what you know. It, it, it works, people. You're one of the smart ones. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, gentlemen, that that is it for uh, for this segment. Uh, we will be back for our evening, our, our uh, Asia Pacific uh, session at 6 p.m. Pacific, and whatever that equates to in uh, Australia, New Zealand time zone. I don't know what we sometimes occasionally have some folks that are on from them, but uh, we'll be back on for the second half uh, in a few hours yeah. and uh, address some other questions. And I'll. Uh, I'll go yeah, through and crazy. scour the interwebs so that Eric has a preview into questions that'll be answered with him not here. <laughs> awesome. Unless he's going to show up, Eric. Speaking you, of not here, do you want to talk about next week's plan? Or oh, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you guys. Uh, uh, so I may be here for the morning session. So I got to look at our activities when we head up to the lake. So I might be here for the morning. All right. Hey. Anyway, okay. thanks, everybody. And we'll Have be back one. in hours. Talk to you later. And for those that are wondering, uh, so this, uh, as we do every week, this is part two of episode 18, and I'm recording in Teams, and I will upload the two Teams recordings, so you'll have to see more of my my face in uh, kind of in, in balance than on, on, yeah, on par with the others. Yeah, I know. You're going to make a joke. Oops. Go ahead. Yours is the cute one. Sorry. <laughs> uh let's see well, anyway. what they used to scare kids into going to bed at night you know <laughs> <laughs> you know this thing is uh, going to come out from underneath the, the, your, your bed or the closet or something so <laughs> yeah uh well um let's see uh anything happen over the course of the day you want to bring up and talk about how but no nothing much so far uh, i was actually I was actually kind of playing this afternoon. Um, um, there is a, well, being an old TV buff, um, somebody, I don't know, uh, a week or so ago posted out on uh, Facebook something about the Nelson Riddle's uh, Route 6060. I thought, yeah, that's neat. I really used to like that, which which got me to thinking and looking to see if there were any Route 66 episodes available out there on the internet that I could, I was 12 at the time, you know, <clears throat> 12, 13, 14 in that area. Anyway, um, I not only found that, but I found that there was an episode that was filmed here. Well, of course, you know, living here all my, the, basically all my life, I, I had to see what this if there was anything recognizable and it was it was kind of a fun trip down memory lane i you know, yeah watched the episode all the way through and then i set about trying to figure out where all the scenes were shot and uh, basically I've, I've come up with every location that they visited uh, really one it not, wasn't not it, they didn't just they, they didn't just film it all in southern or central california like a lot of old shows that were supposed to be somewhere in the midwest and it was actually uh out in the uh you know it was in california somewhere uh, no, this one was filmed on location in Tucson. So, yeah, well. that's the reason I had to go looking around to see if there was anything that was recognizable. As it turns out, there was actually quite a bit of it that was recognizable. It uh, it it took some doing. A good many of the buildings aren't there anymore. But uh, fortunately, the uh, the mountains don't change much, so you kind of get an idea. Particularly when they were up, they in one section of the of the uh, of the uh, the episode uh, they're, they're kind of lo lost out in the desert and uh, by looking at the mountains from around where they were standing because they made reference to some of them i knew right where they were which yeah, is you kind of cool you know you google can, maps yeah, comes in really handy as i say you, you can't can't fake that you know that the yeah. uh the, the mountains if it's uh local there but well, uh, for anybody that's watching on the live stream, uh, we've got a handful of people that are on. It's in a couple locations, mm -hmm. but feel free to post your questions, and we'll try to address them. Uh, I thought Sean was going to be here and and Mike, but uh, maybe they'll yeah. they'll drop in here. Otherwise, Hal and I will do our best. Um, so a couple questions. Um, got a couple Outlook questions uh, that we didn't get to uh, this morning. Um, now one of them, uh, Frio asked the question, how do I install two outlooks in one PC? 
and there's no other detail around that. And so I'm not sure if they're trying to install multiple clients. I'm assuming it's multiple accounts, um, which I have multiple email accounts that are just add different accounts and uh, you know, I have it all in one Outlook client if that's what you're trying to do. Um, you know, yeah, it's well, pretty that's, straightforward. That's kind of the problem with that there. Anymore, you kind of have to be specific. Okay, two Outlooks on my PC. Well, is that two Outlook desktop clients? Is that uh, you want to do Outlook.com with something else or, and it, or, or, or Microsoft 365 on the web? Um, you know, and the short answer to, to the question is, you, well, I want to put two Outlooks on. I mean, and I have to answer that with a question. Why on earth would you want to? Uh, yeah. Well, well I, guess, I, mean, I guess yes. You can add, depends on what they're really asking to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you can add you can add a good many accounts to a micro to a, a an Outlook desktop profile. You have the option of creating multiple profiles for multiple things. Like, for example, if you want something that is com your business com completely separated from your home account. You put the business account in one profile. You put the home account in the other. That means you have to log out of Outlook and log back in in order to to see and the, the one account from the other. So nothing ever gets interchanged that way. There's no accidental. Oh, I I, I moved an email from someplace I shouldn't have to someplace else I should have or any of that, that stuff. That's so. an important distinction too because I was going to say that you can have if you have like I have three separate emails in my one. And plus Gmail, and do I still have a Hotmail? That's I think I still have the Hotmail, but it's not in the Outlook. So I have four email addresses in one Outlook client. Um, three of them are full Office 365 licenses, uh, Outlook licenses. Mm -hmm. And so I have it set up with each of them has distinctive. If I respond to an email, it knows to automatically send with the corresponding, uh, you know, a, a, a name. But you can. Uh, I can go in there uh, and manually switch between them. If I receive an email through one and they've sent it to my Gmail and I'm responding, I can re respond back with my Office 365, my company account. Um, so, uh, but to your point, I think it's an important distinction. If you're trying to keep them separated, then separate profiles uh, make sense. Depends on how you want to toggle through those as well. Are you... Do, do you want to, I mean, you can always create different Windows profiles and log in and out, keep them completely separated. Yeah, uh, that's, so that's kind of what you want to do. Old, yeah. yeah, yeah. But otherwise, uh, I mean, the other way to, of doing that is what's wrong with having one on a desktop and access the other one through browser? Which then, everybody does all the time. And then toggle between them, so... Yeah, there's a few different and ways. There, of course, are some advantages to to, uh, to 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 doing it online, particularly if you're talking uh, to people on the outside world. If you don't happen to have room on your phone or tablet or whatever to grant it Outlook and the, uh, the the Microsoft 365 packages available on a number of different platforms, uh, including both uh, iOS and Android. Um, if you don't have the room to, to have them and the associated data file requirements and so forth, you know, if you've got a small phone like I do, you can, uh, there you use the, uh, the the web versions and save yourself all that trouble. It's also, it's also a way of keeping, uh, uh, bring your own device machines that may or may not meet anyone's security compliance uh, requirements uh, out of any kind of office network. You just use the web clients instead, and you can do that with Office and with pretty much any part of Office. That being both Outlook and Excel and and, and PowerPoint and, and and all of those, Word included. Um, you have the ac access to the, the online OneDrive for all of your file storage and of course SharePoint, Teams, Yada, so forth, and so on. Um, so uh, there's some some distinct advantages over doing that. Yep. Um, I should say doing it on the web versus having, you know, having it all on the desktop. Yep. 
Uh, let's see. The other outlook. Is there another one? Do, 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 do. I thought there might have had a third one in there. No. Okay. Um, so the other question outlook related. Um, Crystal is asking uh, my company. I'm going to move this over so I'm not looking so far over there to the left. Uh, my company has blocked add-ins for Outlook in Office 365. Is there any way to easily save files from Outlook to Teams without add-ins? So um, the, the uh, share to Teams or share with Teams is still not arrived. Um, so that feature is is coming but that is not specifically a you know like a files and attachment method it's you know for the whole email and i i believe with you know any attachments that are there again we haven't seen it so can't really talk about what is you know part of the ga the generally available feature set um, but that is forthcoming but as far as uh you know files I've, you know, it's not a feature that I've gone and looked for a way to, you know, auto download and move files from uh, from Outlook over to anything. I wasn't aware of a third party tool that did that. Are you familiar with anything, Hal? No, not right offhand. And I, I, is it attachments you're trying to move, conversations, calendar items? It, that's and then, you know, for what it's worth currently, uh, you know, Outlook is using pretty much Teams for its messaging and so forth thing. I don't happen to have that handy right this moment. I don't know whether it's a, a plug in or not. Uh, I'm just looking. There's a couple people asking questions out on uh, tech community. Again, there might be a third party tool that does that today. Um, you know, and one of them is to forward the email to a channel. Um, so there's no third party application that's required for that. If uh, the admin for that team has allowed uh, individuals to email a team then that's one way you can get that content. Again, it's going to take the whole email and attachments and send that over. Um, uh, and there's a, what is it? The, oh, um, okay. So yeah, so save Outlook attachment to Microsoft Teams. Good, I've never done this, um, but there's a, on the, for the file for the for the download um uh no that is not it's a i'm gonna have to hang on i'm gonna try this <laughs> Dude, not, i've not seen this i'm not familiar with this um let me let me see i've got an example right there uh no, nope. I mean, even in this, what I'm seeing is that you still have to save it, save the file down. You're not saved any any steps, then upload it from right there, which is not really. Um, um, save all attachments. Yeah, so it's yeah, you're you're still having to. Um, and Sean, we're 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 looking to see. Uh, the, the question was whether you can. Uh, if there's a, a, a an easy way to move files attachments in Outlook straight to Teams, and there's somebody, a couple people responding out in the Microsoft Tech community that like, yeah, just use click on the drop down arrow on the right side of the attached file, go to upload and find your team, but you still have to download the file and then mm -hmm. upload into Teams. So yeah. there's not a straight from Outlook. And, uh, you know, I guess the longer term answer we think will be the share for the, the Outlook feature that's not yet available, the share to Teams. Yeah. Um, but whether you'll be able to share just the attachment or the entire email with the attachment 
is yet to be seen. So right. the interim is download it locally, upload it into Teams. Yeah. Two-step process. No third-party tool necessary. Um, or email to the team, to the channel, if you want the entire email message to be part of that with this attachment. So there's two ways. I'm not aware of any third-party yeah. tools. I'm not either. But um, once it can uh, start working with those cloud resident links so that you don't have to do anything with it locally, that'll be nice. Yeah. That intermediate step is kind of a pain in the butt. Agreed. Hey, here, here's something. Um, so this is, I don't know if you saw it, Sean. Uh, so the, the fact that uh, uh, Mark Anderson over at Simpraxis Consulting, good friend of all of ours. Um, Hal, I don't know if you know Mark, but uh, I'm sure you guys would be best of friends, besties mm -hmm. instantly. Uh, yeah, he's the grumpy old man. Get off my lawn. Yeah, he, he is that. <laughs> Um, but he is, so his team has started writing about the uh, kind of uh, resurgence of the uh, uh, the SharePoint maturity model um, that Sadie Van Buren did, what, like six years ago, seven years ago? Yeah. Uh, and so they've started, you know, writing about that, kind of uh, uh, modernizing that. Um, and there is, uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, I'll provide a link as well. I, um, you know, I don't even know what's still out there. Hang on. So the SPMM. So it was back in the, yeah, SharePoint 2010 days. Yeah. And uh, so that's out. So there's actually something out on. Yeah. So here is a link on the O'Reilly site that Sadie wrote where she outlines it and is there yep and there's the whole table down the 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 bottom how to apply it so this is the a great link for that let me uh share that in the book of faces <laughs> yeah and I'll share it here as well Um, but definitely go take a look at that. Well, the point was, so um, so Mark and the Simpraxis team are writing a bunch of content for Microsoft. And so they've added that content um, as well. Um, I'm looking to see, yeah, so up, there it is. Yeah, so June 12th. Um, so here's the updated version of this. I'll add this link in here. This is really great stuff. So. Um, this is a, and I'll kind of read the intro here. Uh, we often hear from people in the community that they know they aren't using Microsoft 365 capabilities as fully as if, or as efficiently as they would like. Sometimes this can be an existential uh, dread rather than a specific set of clear ideas about what is missing or what to do to work smarter. Taking a holistic view of the technology and gaining an understanding of current state versus desired state can help organizations organizations and then it outlines the ways outlines the model points to Sadie's work and it's just kind of a, a refresh of that so that's an overview the first link that I shared um, is the the detail um, let me sh hit respond on that um, yeah. but yeah, that's good stuff now a few years back what was that five years ago um, six years ago, uh, Melinda Morales and I created the uh, the SharePoint governance maturity model. And um, so that's something I think we've talked about updating that for the broader uh, Microsoft 365. Um, so taking in Teams and OneDrive and some of the other, other aspects of that. And um, uh, so somebody else has gone and and creating or created a version based on just for Microsoft Teams. Um, so there's some interesting resources out there. That whether you're you know internally looking for some help, some guidance, being able to go in and kind of from the table to gauge you know here's where we are on process, here's where we are in action, 
around a number of different areas and say, okay, hey, what does it look like if we improve? What is the next step where we know we've improved? Because that's a big, it's a difficult aspect of measurement. You create a baseline, you go and define here's where we are today, but it's not clear of what that next step is. And right. then, of course, if you're looking for guidance to, to be able to go to internal, external consulting team, a, you know, a project management team to say, help develop a plan for us to get to that next phase, you have an idea of what the outcomes are for each of those areas and are you know more easily able to put a, a plan together a strategy for building that so um yeah, it's a nice definitely approach, worth, yeah definitely worth checking out good stuff um let's see so again if you're watching on the live stream feel free to ask any questions sean anything come up today you wanted to talk about <laughs> no nah, i was going to apologize because i fell asleep Oh, you should never apologize for taking a nap and getting rest. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, I hadn't. I thought I'd lay down for a brief period, and next thing I know, I'm looking up at the clock. It's quarter after nine. I'm like, ah, uh, I think I'm supposed to be somewhere right now. <laughs> it's that it's that middle age. It's setting in on you, man. <laughs> middle age, your kind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, you need to be um, bright and chipper for the uh, 1.30 a.m. Uh, gaming session. So that's what I'm <laughs> oh, preparing geez. for. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, got a couple other questions that I that I pulled down there. We've not already addressed from the two uh, Facebook communities that we're pulling questions from. Um, they may not be long discussion points, though. Um, oh, real quick, by the way, you guys saw my note that I will not be able to join next week. So you guys yeah. got it. Riz claims he's going to participate <laughs> and hit the record button on those. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I think the over under is 50, 50 on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I will share some questions. I'll collect a few and share them before I head out the door and. I thought I, I might be able to join the uh, the APAC session, the evening session next week. Uh, yeah, I might look very different. I might be burnt to a crisp. I'll be out in the sun the entire day. I I'm certainly like, hope You're not. You're sunblock. Oh, I do. You know how well that stuff stays on when you're on <coughs> CU, you know? Oh, man. Uh, all right. Well, here's a question. So, um, Jiraj asks, uh, OneDrive for Business regional settings defaults. Is it possible to change those regional defaults. And he says, our tenant defaults to English uh, and time zone for newly created user accounts. Despite this, is possible to change on the user level, but it's a bit cumbersome. Uh, the administrator change is also possible, but very cumbersome as well. Mm. I don't know, what are they looking for? I want one button that just does it, that knows what I want to do. I hit the button and it changes it. Um, says, I'd like to change the default to something else, but so far, no luck. Does anyone know which tenant-wide setting would achieve this? So I do not. That's So the regional settings, no like, that is, I mean, it's at the tenant level. I mean, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going into the admin portal right now to... We'll find out in real time, people. Yeah. Well, Somebody knows see. and is watching and they want to just tell us, they want to inform us, then feel free. So he's asking for OneDrive and what else? Uh, 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 yeah, just the OneDrive for business regional settings defaults. I started to look for the answer to this uh, earlier. I was in uh, uh, doing some other admin changes, um, testing out a, an ISV solution and uh, opened up the admin console. And as usually happens, it's still open. <laughs> a, call came in. a call came in, I went back to doing the actual work and then never got back to looking still at it. Still sitting there, yeah. Yeah. 
So I'm looking through the OneDrive settings now, and I'm not seeing anything. Let's see, e-discovery alerts. Uh, yeah, so my thinking is, I'm sure that's a configuration setting, but that's going to probably be one of those that ease, is easiest gotten to from, uh, you know, some PowerShell manipulation of the Office 365 object model and uh, settings. But I do not have any script handy to deal with that. That's not one that I've been asked to really make changes to. I'm just one of those dumb Americans who's used to everything being 1033 uh, Unicode page, you know, EN dash US. So I did a quick Google search and typed in changing OneDrive for business regional settings and the organic, the top uh, snippet says to change your personal language and region settings. So on a user by user basis, rather than across the board for a tenant. Yeah, it makes sense that it's it's set for each user because every user is gonna, of course, have uh, their own specific setting for that. But I, I don't even know if that's, I've got to believe it's managed on a tenant wide basis, but um, that's one I'd have to look into. I'll probably, let me see if I can look into that and come back with it. Yeah, so, I mean, I see other comments here that OneDrive for Business default time. Um, See, it, default time zone cannot be changed once a tenant is created. Hmm. Yeah, and then it basically says, uh, as a workaround, SharePoint Online admin can help existing users update their regional settings, including dot time zone, using a CSOM script. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. Yeah, let me let me grab um, let me share this. So this is probably the closest thing. I would say the only. I mean, I, I hate just uh, not fully answering something and pushing somebody to support, but this is one of those things that that's when you're paying for support. You know, getting their help on that process. But this is otherwise. This is a community response in the Microsoft community uh, answers.microsoft.com. Um, and somebody has provided, if you look at the first response, the, the uh, um, it's got you know, two top responses there. Uh, but the one from September 12th um, from Skypay plus one uh, has the links to the uh, Office 365 change the locale of all OneDrive for business sites using PowerShell as well as the new SharePoint CSOM version released for Office 365 has those two links. And that's going to be probably what you need. Yeah, well, the the newness of this, to put it in perspective, um, the change locale for business sites using PowerShell is from April 2015. So, uh, yeah. The born on date were well passed. So, yeah, this script goes in. Um, it's going through the user profile service. And by login name, gets the user. And on the OneDrive for business backing website it's setting the regional settings locale id and making a change at that level so 
So this will change it in the case of the OneDrive for Business site, but more specifically, I'm sure these settings are available on other objects in the Office 365 space, Microsoft 365 space. Um, and I don't know that this sort of information I'll have to check in with Yina and the graph team to see if um, they've uh, offered a, a more uh, holistic kind of encompassing uh, way to get at this information through graph, because this is the kind of thing that graph would wrap up. Yeah. So I'll take that as a to do. Yeah, the uh, and, and part of the problem that the, the obvious complexity around this is easy, even if you have end users that are going and doing this, you know, one by one, there's still the syncing of the other services for that change, which requires PowerShell. So it's not just a uh, UI driven, end user driven. I'll go and fix it myself. Yeah, and this is just you know again working with. Um user profile service, people manager, um, finding the user object and making the change at that level. So it's very specific and targeted to a particular user. So it's not a obviously default change for anything. Just once your user object exists, it changes it for you. But um, I suspect that um, you know, when you set up a SharePoint web or SharePoint site online, uh, you have the option of specifying specific to the web back, you know, in the on-prem days, back in the old days, the web application had a set of settings assigned to it for user locale information and time zones and that was set at the web app setting level and off of that the site collections um, that were built within that web application i think pulled their their baseline settings from specific to times and time zones and locales yep Imagine some version of that still, um, since that was the way the on-prem model did it, I'm sure it exists like that out in Office 365 because the entire object model didn't change. It was just a, you know, back when in the 2010 days when the tenant-based extensions were added, the ability to, uh, to group things at the tenant level rather than at the farm level, um, that's when those came into play. You got all that, Hal? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on the test. So, yeah, the test. <laughs> Just what we don't need. Um, let's see. No other questions posted. Monday evenings are usually quieter. Oh, hey, by the way, um, I need to put you in touch with uh, Gregory, Greg Frick. Um, so he is interested in connecting. Um, I don't know if you saw that, that's over in the Microsoft Teams community. Um, so we talked about it this morning. Um, do you know Greg? You know Greg. I don't. You, you've been out to one of the events out in Seattle. You'll you'll know him when you, as soon as you talk to him. But I mean, he okay. was the president of the user group for like 10 years. Okay, yeah, uh, I we've not met. Okay. But, uh, but anyway, because you can reach them through Facebook messaging that way. But otherwise, I'll connect you via email. Okay. Sounds good. Always looking to uh, meet another person in the space. Yeah. Never hurts. And uh, all right. While we're waiting to see, we got still have a handful of people that are watching. You know, Feel free to 
ask a, a question, just type it out somewhere in the book of faces and we'll get it. <laughs> um, let's see. I had another question lined up here. Um, uh, oh, you know, it, I'll finish a thought on the uh, Microsoft 365 maturity model. Why I brought that up is that there's actually uh, so Peter Carson and the uh, the EUM team have got a webinar on the topic. Um, so they're they're expanding that to um, so they kind of went down that path and it was actually Mark that reached out to Peter. So Peter Carson's uh, president of uh, Envision IT, the consulting company and extranet user manager product company. Uh, but this webinar that's happening on the 29th of this month, I guess I could grab a link to that, um, but where he was walking through it and then Mark saw that and reached out and like, hey, did you see that we've started kind of resurfacing that old uh, content? But uh, yeah, really good stuff. So if you want to have an idea, get an idea, I think it's going to be a great, it's more conversational than presentation. Um, this yeah. is going to be a great webinar. Um and Peter's doing a series around this. So it's happening on the 29th. We're going to kind of walk through an overview of the maturity model, talk about the Microsoft learning pathways, um, talk about building a strategy for better Microsoft 365 utilization. Um, it's a good topic for anybody using Teams and SharePoint and OneDrive and any other workload trying to figure out how to get them all working better together and and to optimize across the entire platform um it's a it's yeah. a worthwhile topic sounds like good stuff yeah yeah timely that it uh has been resurfaced now i think a lot yeah. of people benefit from it yeah I, a lot of great i brought up this morning the fact that we've got uh so eum is hosting sue hanley to talk about uh, you know, information architecture and how all of that work that we've done in SharePoint over the last decade, how that translates into Microsoft Teams and carry what carries over, what doesn't, what's different, um, you know, what you need to think about. I mean, just a, another, these are all great topics that were, you know, a big deal in the SharePoint world and are still a big deal in the SharePoint world and now the Teams world and um, a lot of things the same, a lot of things. There are nuances, of course, so um, good stuff. Same model, different lips, lipstick. Yeah, but again, that's another one where, actually, I prefer the model where it's going to be Peter and uh, uh, it should be me. If if I'm not there, then I think Riz will be there and Sue Handley talking about information architecture. It should be a, a great discussion. Well, um, as long as this that, Riz isn't left to himself. That's true. Because That's we don't true. want to do that to anyone. Well, there are laws. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there and lawsuits. Lawsuits. There, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. there are protections in place to leave people so that we're not left alone with Riz. Yeah, I trust Sue. <laughs> I don't trust Riz. Uh, we say that with love, people. Yeah, of course. Eric Riz. Well, he's not on Facebook anyway, so. Nah, he's one of those yeah, weirdos. We could, we could we could trash talk him. Yeah, refuses his one inner urges there. Yeah. Wacky Canadians. Yeah, it's crazy talk. I just found somebody else today that uh, that refuses to do the Facebook thing and then keeps asking questions. Well, what are people talking about this? I'm like, go see for yourself. Yeah, really. Why, <laughs> why are you forcing me in this middleman position? Just go join. Just don't. Don't follow anybody, block people, don't friend anybody, but then still do the community stuff. Yeah. That that sounds better to me every day. Than having you in the middle? I expect yeah, so. No, no. I, like locking people out, re, like removing people, unfriending everybody, but then just participating <laughs> in the community stuff. Yeah. Just that aspect Definitely. of it. Yeah. Well, you I know, it's like, that. Sean, you, you and I, I don't know where Hal is, like, we're at the opposite ends of a lot of the politics stuff, but both of us agree. We're right in the middle of like, a lot of people need to shut up and just let's, we're talking work stuff. Let's just yeah. talk about work stuff. Stop yeah. it. We can easily yeah. focus on that. It's not a religion, people. Politics is not a religion. 
if if you've crossed that barrier to into when it's a religion, then you got a lot of problems. Yeah, and your prescription bills are probably going up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got another question here. Um, I've not previewed it, so I'm going to read it raw, just out there. Um, oh, Hyder hi. is asking, um, hi all, we are using a client server based utility wherein the client application is stored in local drive, whereas the access database, I don't think it's access with a capital A, just the okay. you know, access database is stored in a network drive. Wanted to know if the entire utility, so the client app as well as the access database, can be moved to Microsoft Teams so as to remove the dependency of network drives. Any ideas? Probably not. Um, so in that context, it sounds like he is using an access database across the wire, um, which I've seen many organizations do before, but then you get into permissions across the wire, and though you can store files online, um, on it's the not line. as, yeah, on the line, exactly. <laughs> Thinking pay phone all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, wow. But yeah, it's not, it's not SMB file, uh, sharing as you would have in a, you know, kind of a local network sort of situation. Um, though you can get the files across HTTP, different protocols and different permission models are, are involved. So it's not as, it seems like it should work, and in probably some worlds, it's been made to work through things like WebDAV, and WebDAV is a very old, nasty, Byzantine technology, technological stack that if you've ever seen diagrammed, it is nightmarish in how it is implemented um, for file access to make it, to make files on the internet and on network locations look like they're in standard file systems when they in fact are not. Um, so yeah, I don't think that that's going to work for you. You're going to have to get it to some um, source that at least you can interact with it through some layer that treats it like a file share and has permissions set up in an equivalent fashion, but that's not Teams. Yeah, well, that's that's the main point that it, it what they're trying to do is not a fit for what Teams is. Yeah. So. I can understand trying to make it that way, but that's unfortunately stretching the metaphor too far. Yeah. Well, this goes back to a topic I think we addressed in one of the first episodes but uh it was a conversation point in the early like the first year of teams is does teams replace so microsoft teams replace the need for a portal like a sharepoint portal um and and, and so i guess that you can argue like for for my organization a small company you know one principal some part-time people that are in there in there i've got about a dozen people that have different licenses to access into my environment um, that we do everything inside of Teams. So the only stuff I do in SharePoint besides the back end of Teams is I have demo stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't have a standard portal. It just the, there's no need for it. It would be duplicate work of other places. It just doesn't fit the way that we work and what we need. Yeah, that's a lot of time and effort for just right. a handful of people. Right. Um, it, you know, it, it, but you know, even in that case, I wouldn't try to go recreate or just certainly migrate other applications, other solutions over inside of Teams, um, where it's a fit for possibly for SharePoint Online or just retire the old way of doing it and doing it whatever new way. Right. Yeah, because I mean, there are web technologies that will address that need that you're indicating you've got with that application. It's just going to require some uh, re-architecture and uh, redevelopment or re-implementation um, off of something other than, you know, server message block 
file share type stuff. All right, let's see. Um, okay, we've got um, got about 15 minutes left. So if anybody that's watching on the live stream, if you have any questions you'd like us to try to tackle, uh, feel free to type it in. Yeah, if we haven't butchered your uh, favorite topic well, well enough yet, we're always willing to. Uh, yeah, there's always time to destroy something else. I, you know, honestly, in 15 minutes, I think we could butcher 20 to 50 questions easily. Yeah. Yeah. Without lifting uh, so much as a finger. No, no, I think that's the point is to not lift a finger and then we <laughs> destroy them, <laughs> not answer them, and not yeah. provide any value. <laughs> <laughs> or we could probably handle two, three other questions. Yeah, ex <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, there's some telephony stuff, with, which is like yeah, not really our thing. This is a yeah. different world. Yeah. Even though Microsoft rolls it all up into services, uh, don't take the rolling of those things together into services to somehow may mean that they suddenly are on equivalent playing fields with equivalent sets of knowledge. They're, they're still very different disciplines. They've just been brought together nicely by Microsoft. Yeah. Well, you know, th there were, uh, so a few years back when uh, you had still, of course, the, just thinking is that, I guess it was, uh, you know, after the Skype acquisition, um, but there were, you know, across the U.S., there were maybe a dozen really good UC uh, vendors, so unified communications vendors that everybody used. And there probably were more, but I'm saying the go-to, like the experts that had MVPs on staff and really knew what they were doing, there was like a dozen of them. That's it. It wasn't it, – it, it's it was, so those those companies did really well. Um, specializing in that, but almost all of their people came from that that background, telecom background, unified communications background, and a lot of them, ones I talked to, worked with, they had, like I, I worked um, years ago uh, at uh, Pacific Bell, and uh, mm. so big phone company in California, they got uh, acquired, I was there doing the acquisition by Southwestern Bell, Southwestern Bell bought Ameritech bought uh, Southern New England Telephone, SNET or SNET, um, and then bought AT&T and then rebranded with a as AT&T. But it's really Southwestern Bell people that bought everybody, um, took over the world, reconstituted the old AT&T brand. Um, but you know, a lot of the, the people that were in the UC world, uh, at least in the Western US, they all had Pac Bell Internet, and DLEC, CLEC backgrounds, the DSL companies, or they came through you know, like Lucent and Octel and right. a bunch of these other telecom providers. And uh, so it was like they found their their space. And so, uh, it, you right. know, there's right. a lot of consolidation them. phase. Like my, my go to people right now are Jonathan McKinney and, and Adam Ball. Um, so because they're just over the hill, they're over in the Denver side of the hill from me. Yeah. Um, so same time zone, it's the easiest, but they they generally have all the questions, but they, uh, you know, they all the answers for the, those questions, but you know, they're, they're in demand for that stuff too. So. Yeah. Yeah. The great consolidation days. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah. So MPLS circuit for Microsoft team services. Oh boy. Uh, um, says, does anyone knows about summary report at admin center? There is overall call activity, server client, client to client, voice quality SLA. I didn't see any info inside. Mm -hmm. Summary report. Yeah, don't know. It's all teams related stuff. Um, more PBX questions. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, people. Yeah. That's like 
back when I did IT support. You know, can you fix the fax machine? I'm like, we're not even speaking the same language here. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I'll certainly look at it. You got a washing machine I can look at at the same time? Can you fix that, Sean? <laughs> I just... <laughs> I, My response, I it, we'll see. I, I found an awesome video that was one of those where uh, it was just one of those daily internet and name videos. And in fact, I think it was a collection of videos that were people found that were safe for viewing at work or, or home in mixed company, but from Reddit. And one of them was somebody found in a junkyard a washing machine uh, and it was just, just torn apart gave it power and it worked but it was chunk 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 and just shaking all over the place and I think I, I oh yeah saw that and, and it made me think video. so i have a bumble ball oh man that for my grandson and <laughs> it made me think it's like you could build all you need to do is weld on some kind of nubs or something onto that washing machine that box and you have a giant bumble ball bumble ball <laughs> yeah, if you don't know what this is by the way it's uh, so I'll turn it on here. Oh my god, the batteries are low on it, but you put it down and it just kind of yeah, jiggles. So, uh, yeah, my I was gonna say that dogs love it, except that both of my dogs are afraid of it. That's fantastic, uh, but uh, but wouldn't that be like that. the coolest thing <laughs> to have that? Like this big, giant industrial strength. I mean, it'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, while you're laughing, you may cause, lose an arm. Uh, cause of death, bumbled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a way to go. <laughs> yeah. Darwin Award winner of the year. Industrial strength, bumble ball, death by bumble ball. <laughs> yeah. You Fantastic. Ways to go, yeah. Yeah. It just got me thinking now. Um, I dropped some stuff off for the weekend at the thrift store, and I was thinking about going in. I wonder if they have any old washing machines. I could... <laughs> Do not. <laughs> don't. I, think it, well, I don't have the welding. that I need, like, spot welding. I need to figure it out. I mean, there's there'd be some more effort involved, but I, I it would be fun to do. I think your wife might say otherwise. Yeah, and then powering it as well would, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. I'm just, I'm just Leave saying it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Call the one of those guys. Yeah, one of sure. the uh, MythBusters guys, the uh, the 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 younger guys. Uh, he just passed away. Um, what's his name? Grant. Oh, really? Not Jamie or Adam. Yeah, no, no. One of the the junior, the three, the the two guys. It's one of the guys. Oh, uh, that's too bad. Yeah, so I think he had like a, I don't know what what it was, like a heart attack or a, you know brain aneurysm or something or other. It was. I mean, he's too young. He was. He's only forty eight, I think. Forty seven. Forty seven. Wow. Uh, yeah, so really sad. Uh, and a lot healthier than I am, so. <laughs> survived all those years on the show only to go yeah. that way huh? but uh but i was just my point was that i could do it and dedicated to grant you know so i think rackley would help he understands me there i'm not i'm not sure i'm gonna rackley email. would be very interested in the results <laughs> he might back you on it he might say he supports you on it but help <laughs> but i um i don't know what kind of help you're thinking you're gonna get yeah well we're too far apart you know uh geographically to make that work that kind of help anyway but uh you know no. maybe maybe we put a big paint group you know uh, uh, uh sponsor you know sticker on it or something you know <laughs> now hit melissa his wife will not stand for that <sighs> I mean, she's a good woman, but, um, you know, she'll call BS on him every now and then. And Well, we all do, though. I mean, it's Mark. Come on. <laughs> yeah, well, 
she's a good woman to be married to him. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, one final question. Let's see. Um, Oh, here's an interesting question. Uh, is there an ability to turn off thread? This comes from Cade, not out of my own imagination. Uh, is there an ability to turn off threading of conversations in channels? Um, I'll read the rest of it here. Maybe we aren't following standard use case, but when we use Slack, we add channels for ongoing projects. Um, uh, so 365 migration, DC setup, under the 365 migration, we would post anything about the 365 migration. Under DC setup, anything about DC setup. However, with Teams, it has threading, so we end up with a bit of a mess since it isn't one big thread. Mm. Can we turn off replies so everything is just one big conversation? Flatten out the conversation structure, huh? Yeah, um, and so I think a couple of people responded, um, you know, are, are you just using chat? Why not create a team and then channels for each topic? Um, somebody else, Martin, says, no, you cannot turn it off. Adopt the team's way and reconfigure your way of working. Mm, yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, but I think that's a good point that Peter made is that um, you can just use chat and that's the way that it works. Um, right. When you want threaded discussion, uh, it's that ongoing around a, you know, a channel, then that's what channel conversations, you cannot flatten that discussion. But in a chat, that's what it is. It's flat. Yeah, it's and, just rolling. Yep. Um, yeah, and, and, he, and he, Cade clarifies, he says, maybe I'm not explaining correctly. In a channel, I feel it is too easy to start a new conversation versus just continuing the same one so you end up with you know a bunch of a single conversation that jumps around and you have to search through other side conversations to find to follow up on that thread which i i completely understand i think martin's response of look if you're looking for something that's dedicated to that topic create a channel yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think you're trying to, and once you get to that point, you're trying to co-opt the product to work a very specific way when the ability to uh, thread those discussions is by many seen as a benefit, not a disadvantage. Well, there's a couple options too, is that you can always create a tag or use a hashtag. And so you can filter your view based on that, that tag. So you can have that and so just have, to, it's it's a training issue then, and anybody wants to talk about that specific topic that they add the hashtag in there to be able to filter the view on that. Um, and uh, you know, the other, this is just one of those things where you just need to have good community moderation to guide people, correct them you know, uh, on that, because they can go back in and edit a comment where they forgot to add the hashtag or the tag into that. So um, you can yeah. do that. Or, a little training, a little lead by example. That's right. Stuff. Or create a different channel or create a chat. So you can you can do that if you want to. Uh, I mean, the, the, other, the other thing, and this kind of goes back to depending on how you're using Teams, my guidance is always that uh, uh, if you're trying to follow a conversation in an all-hands Everyone has access, all access uh, a team. Good luck to you. Yeah. Uh, Teams is was designed and was initially uh, promoted as something that is for your working team. That small bit. There's a reason why the ideal number of the most optimal number of direct reports for a manager is actually five employees. That's the optimal team size, a manager, a project manager, and five employees. Um, data has shown. Um, can you do more? Sure, you can do that, depending on the, uh, the level of activity. 
But when you're trying to have a focused conversation, if you've got a bunch of people that are trying to do something and taking something sideways, my first response would be, you have the right people in there. You invited everybody in. Right. The cacophony of the cocktail party. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can solve that by saying, pull the, it's now gotten too loud. Let's go over into this side room and have a chat or create a new channel uh, where the five people that actually need to discuss that 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 topic can be at peace absolutely so yeah i'm with you on that all right well we we are over time gentlemen so thanks so much for participating and for those that uh that haven't seen this if uh what i'll be doing uh tomorrow is i'll be uh consolidating both our am and pm recordings uh, and upload that to YouTube. You can go and find all of this out on YouTube under uh, my company, Collab Talk. You can find these office hours recordings. This is episode 18. Uh, and 18. Uh, also on the, uh, on the Buckley Planet blog, I will go through and I'll add this to the description also in YouTube, but I go through and parse through every topic and add the timestamps with links for those. So you don't have to sift through two hours of content you'll be able to jump to the specific uh, uh topics that we have that we jump around in as well as i also timestamp the uh the fun topics the non-essential topics the <laughs> anecdotes yeah the uh, the the us killing time in between that as always if you have questions um you can reach out to sean hal myself uh through the social channels whatever is your preference we're all over the place uh, if you have other questions, if you post them over in Facebook and CC, all three of us are out there. Um, so Sean P. McDonough or SP McDonough, uh, mm -hmm. TV Wizard and Buckley Planet on Twitter. You can reach us out, but we will respond to stuff. You don't have to wait a whole week. Um, but if you post them up on Facebook in either the Microsoft Teams or the Office 365 communities, we will likely answer them next week as well so if there's anything that's up there over the course of the week yeah and with that draw our attention to it yep gentlemen have a great rest of your evening you too and uh, we'll talk to you next monday talk to you later yeah I, I uh well actually i fly out so thursday night i fly to minnesota good luck with that and then yeah, drive but... yeah i'm excited uh, get to see the grandson, but then driving them back to Utah via Mount Rushmore, which is one of my favorite monuments. I'm excited to go see it before they tear it all down. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get some good pictures along the yeah. way. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, it'll, I'm sure be freakishly hot. And uh, so that'd be fun. But Black Hills, if you've not been there, uh, there it's, it's just gorgeous. That part of the U S is just beautiful. So, Looking forward to it. We'll be driving through Sturgis as well. Oh, wow. I need to check to make sure that Sturgis is not happening. Yeah. I don't know what time of year it's happening, but I'm sure the COVID is not stopping that. Yeah. No. That's hard to say, but uh, yeah. yeah, I would steer clear of that. <laughs> yeah. Just quick story. My first time visiting Mount Rushmore was right smack dab in the middle of Sturgis and oh, when wow. I pulled into Billings, Montana, and there were no hotel rooms, and I said, ah, it's, it's okay, I, I can drive for a couple more hours into northern Wyoming, going towards South Dakota, and the guy at the hotel is like, you're not going to find anything. He's like, you need to go west to find any open hotels. You're not going to find anything within 500 miles, 400 no. miles. And it was like 400 miles of Sturgis. Everything just was gonna, built solid while Sturgis. Yeah, you're just going to find rows and rows of bikes. <sighs> yeah. So it's the it's where, for people that know Sturgis, uh, that's where, is it headquarters of Harley-Davidson? Harley-Davidson. And so it's their annual event, and their Harley's hundreds of miles radius from Sturgis. Yeah, it's the uh, biker's burning, man. It, I will also nope. say that I had my two young sons with me, three young sons with me. And we went to Mount Rushmore and a couple times where I had to uh, redirect the boys quickly back <laughs> into the bookstore. The uh, <laughs> There were some 
biker crowds that uh, were lacking clothing. So Little unsavory. Yes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, Sturgis, good times. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, guys. Take we'll it easy. All right. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.